you've ever been a part of a team or organization or ministry that relies heavily on volunteer involvement to get things done, you maybe have noticed that it's harder to get people to volunteer for things maybe now than it's ever been. So you think about like booster club, PTO, PTA, summer baseball leagues with coaches and people to help with the upkeep or in the concession stand or whatever it is. It's like, it's like, you know, pulling teeth to get people to say yes. And the reality is, people want the benefit of things like the Booster Club, but people don't want to jump in and help out and fulfill their responsibility and their obligation. In fact, I was just, um, this, this year here, I'm not coaching, therefore I'm like, well, I, I need to help out whenever they need help out. And so Booster Club's like, hey, we still have some dates available. And I looked at the sign up sheet and I'm like all the dates are available like some is not as accurate as all like what you know how come people aren't and it's like you know you look at this and it's why aren't people doing this now when I was in St. Louis um, Titus played summer league baseball where it's like you had to write the league a $50 check and when you signed up and served either in the concession stand or you helped weed eat for a you know an afternoon you got your check back if you didn't help out they would just deposit it and then you know thank you for your donation I thought that's the way to do it just up the ante a little bit people would be signing up like you wouldn't believe you wouldn't be able to have enough opportunities for people to serve and it just seems like over the course of like each generation people have, are becoming more inward focused they look less for opportunities to serve they look less for opportunities to be a good neighbor to help out and, and look out for people it's we become more inward focused. That's true of, I think, individuals. And that can be true of churches as well. Churches, if they're left to their own default mode, become inward focused as opposed to outward. And the, the, the problem with that is, if we're not always looking for opportunities to be light in a dark world and to reach people who are far from God and just try to like keep each other happy and do what we all like, we're not fulfilling the mission of Christ. In the same way, if we as individuals become so inward focused and make life just about us and our mission and what we want as opposed to God, the ramifications of that are potentially eternity for lost souls. It's a big deal. And as the, um, the author, Jude, is kind of writing warnings for the Christians that are experiencing wolves in sheep's clothing that have come in, one of the big things that he's going to highlight is the wolves in sheep's clothing that you've got to watch out for. They are takers, and they are not givers. And the problem is, they will take, 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 and not be an actual vibrant part of the Christian community. And we're going to walk through this, and when we get to the application, it's going to seem so trivial when it's like, this is how we're supposed to live, this is how we're supposed to think, and you're like, does that even, like, is that even a big deal? <laughs> does that even, like, mean anything really? And what we're going to find out, I think, is that the little things like that mean everything. So we're going to be in the book of Jude, verses 11 through 16, because Jude's only one chapter. And he had just talked about, Jude had just talked about how you have these, these false teachers, these evil people that have come into the church, and they follow their own desires, whatever appetites they have, they pursue those and they, they bring them into their life and then they pass them on to people in the church. And so Jude says, because of all of that, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain, <coughs> excuse me, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. So you have three Old Testament examples that these wolves in sheep's clothing are adhering to whenever they make their way into the church. So the, the way of Cain, Genesis 4, we remember that Cain and Abel, brothers, both bring gifts to God. Abel's is accepted, Cain's is rejected. And God says to Cain, if you do what is right, will it not be accepted? He's telling Cain, I'm not playing favorites here. It's not like I like him and I don't like you. If you do what's right and you give out of abundance um, or out of, out of um, sacrificially all that I've blessed you with, will I not accept your offering and the sacrifice that you bring to me? But because of pride in Cain's heart, like he, this is good enough and why is, it, why is his and mine not, 
it creates pride, and then it creates jealousy, and then what happens is eventually murder. Now, the thing about sin, this is a little side note. Sin never stays the same. You either deal with it and you get rid of it, or it will grow. It never stays where it is. Just think about like the last week that we had before this rain came in. I have some boxes that I was looking to burn, but we've still got beans around us. And when you have that wind and everything's really dry, I'm like, I, I'm not burning the boxes because I don't want to take out an entire 40 acres of beans that are around me. Because you can light a fire and you can walk away, but you know what's going to happen to that thing if it's a windy day and it's dry around you? The fire doesn't stay contained in its little area that you've got for it. It's the same way with sin. The conditions are always right in terms of in our heart for sin to spread just like a fire. So Cain, God says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Cain, you better master this or it's going to rear up and it's going to get you. This is what happens to him. Pride leads to jealousy, which leads to murder. And this is the type of thing that happens in our lives as well and in the people that are... Um, in the church that Jude is writing to. He says they also um, have the heir of Balaam. Numbers 22 and 24 talk about this, and greed is the big idea from there. Basically, Balaam, he was a prophet. A king named Balak wanted him to come and curse the Israelites on his behalf. And God's like, hey, don't go with them. And he sent more messengers, the king did, to Balaam, and they offered him more money. And he's like, let me ask God again. He said not to go, but maybe he's changed his mind and really, the bottom line is he saw all the dollar signs and went to him. Like, he was like, okay, I think I want to go and see. Like, maybe I can say something to get the money. And that's when, that's when on the way, the angel of the Lord standing in the road, is, he's going to assassinate Balaam. Remember his donkeys running all over the place, running into walls, running off the path. And then Balaam has a conversation with his donkey. Remember that story? And he's like, how ridiculous for donkeys to talk. Have you been to Washington, D.C.? There's lots of donkeys who talk there, okay? Now, for the record, I remember being at VBS here. I was a fifth grader, and um, Jerry Wilson was teaching us, and he was teaching this passage from the Old King James. This thing is a tough passage to read when you read it from the Old King Jimmy because it doesn't say donkey. It uses a different term for donkey. And if you're old enough to know, you're like, oh, yeah, there's another name for donkey, and Balaam was beating his donkey, and a bunch of fifth graders, we were just, we could not hold it together. And Jerry's like, come on, guys, let's get through this. And I'm like, you've lost us. We are not coming back. There's no way here. But the issue is greed. These false teachers that have come in, they are greedy. And they're always looking for opportunities to grab and to take. And they're no, they never give. They just simply take. And then he ends with Korah's rebellion. In Numbers 16, the Israelites, you know, they're wandering around the wilderness. And Korah and some of his guys stand up against Moses and Aaron. And they tell the Israelites, and they stand before God, and they're like, they're not the only ones who can lead us. Like, God, doesn't he speak to all of us? Don't we have dreams and visions? Don't we have insights? So God's like, all right, Moses, Aaron over here, Korah and his guys over here. And the earth swallowed them up. What a way to go. God wanted to make sure that all the Israelites, when they're like, okay, we've got these guys were seized. Oh, the earth just swallowed them up. Clearly, they're not the way to go. We're going to follow Moses and Aaron. That actually happened to a guy at Ambrier Golf Course in Waterloo. It was back in like 2013. I was living in St. Louis at the time. And I had played that course, and I think that guy was using his foot wedge a little too much. And God's like, no, no, no. Literally fell into a sinkhole. He was okay. That's why I can share that story. In fact, when they interviewed him, his big thing was, I can't wait to play golf again. His shoulder was dislocated. It was in a sling. He's like, I can't wait to get out there and play golf again. I'm like, really? His wife was probably like, honey, I think that's a sign. I don't think you should be playing golf ever again. But nonetheless, if you saw two groups of people and these guys get swallowed up, you'd be like, okay, these were some pretty bad dudes. So the people that, that Jude is talking about, they have pride and ego, they are greedy, and they are rebellious. That's the big idea that he wants us to understand as we walk through it. He continues talking about him. He says, these people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. Shepherds exist to take care of the sheep, 
But if the shepherd's out with the sheep and only is concerned with himself and his own safety, like, you know, if a, if a coyote or a wolf comes in, shepherds don't run, shepherds stand and fight. And shepherds will go hungry and they'll go without sleep to make sure they take care of their sheep. But in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 3, <clears throat> Ezekiel talks about how the current leaders in Israel are like, they're false teachers, they're false prophets, they're shepherds that only feed themselves. And he says, these people at your love feasts, and you know, the early church, when they would take communion together, they would often do it within the context of a full-on meal, just like Jesus when he instituted the Last Supper. So they sit together, they eat together, they fellowship together, they pray together, and Jude's like, you have blemishes that are there. Now, blemishes in real life, like, you remember when you were in junior high, and that awkward stage, and like you bought, your mom would buy you special stuff to put on your face, and you'd wash, and like stay away from greasy foods. You did everything you could, and then when you got a blemish, you didn't walk around and show that off with pride. Look what I got. It's right on my nose. I look like Rudolph, don't I? You didn't do that. You were like, oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. Mom, don't make me go to school today. I was more embarrassed by blemishes than I was when I had poison ivy all over my face. Why? Because it's not supposed to be there. I was like, what, what, do, what, like, what can I do? Like, you put on makeup. Can you put on makeup? Now, for context, this is before boys wore makeup, okay? I was like, I'll do anything to get rid of these blemishes. And Jews like, these blemishes that are at your love feasts, you don't try to hide them and conceal them. You don't try to get rid of them. You wear them, like, with pride. And as he continues to describe them, he says, they're clouds without rain. Blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. So when you think about clouds in the sky, they would have drier seasons than we just had. And whenever you see a dark cloud, spring up you're like maybe this is going to result in rain and you get excited and then the wind just takes the cloud away from you or you think about autumn trees peaches pears apples the fall is when the harvest of the fruit trees happens jesus at one point goes out to get figs from a tree it didn't have fruit he cursed it and it died trees are supposed to produce fruit these false prophets, these false teachers, they produce no fruit, they produce no rain, they are no good to anybody because they are, once again, takers and not givers. Enoch, remember the guy Enoch, he walked with God and one day God just took him away. It's like, poof, he's just gone. You read in Genesis, you'll see that. But Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. He said, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. This is the second coming. This is the final judgment that's being referenced here. And to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and all of the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Bottom line is, judgment is coming. We don't know when. There's a clock ticking down. We don't know when it's going to zero. We don't know how much time's left on the clock, but we believe eventually the clock will hit zero, and when it does, eternity will begin for everybody. And you will spend forever in God's presence or forever cast out of his presence. You and I get to decide where we go because God's grace is offered to all people. But about these false prophets, he's like, you know, here they are. They're coming to your love feasts, and maybe they're wealthy. Maybe they're smooth talkers. Maybe they're, just, they're you know, whatever. But eventually, they're going to have to pay for their unwillingness to submit to God and his authority. And here's how he ends this section. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. I want you to think about how this plays out in everyday life. Because on my worst days, when I'm frustrated and stressed about things, I'm a grumbler, I'm a fault finder. I'm gonna follow my own evil desires. I'm gonna boast about myself when I feel insecure or my ego takes over. I'm gonna flatter others. I'm gonna do things for the purpose of not building others up but, but using people as an ends or a means to an end rather. Like we do this without realizing it because in our natural state, 
We are inward focused and we care most about us. And when you think, okay, well, how does this play out in everyday life and what does it look like? The application, the application of it all and like trying to figure out an area of your life if you're doing this, at, at a certain point you're like, aren't we being nitpicky? Isn't this a minor thing that we're talking about? No. If you have an attitude like this in any area in any relationship it will be used to take people away from God as opposed to closer to him that's what's at stake here so think for a moment when you get together with your closest friends or when you sit down with your spouse and you think about your day and you process it are you a grumbler and a fault finder does everything that you talk about with the people that you're closest with or with your spouse, is it just negative, 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 negative? Well, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, my, if I was in charge of that, I would do it. So they're just, oh my gosh, I can't believe them. There's a term for that, Monday morning quarterback. When you don't lead anything and you know how to lead everything, maybe you should lead something. But then, then you're open to criticism and it's easier to talk bad about other people than for you to be talked about about so you would just rather sit not do anything and just grumble and complain about everybody else and what they're doing that's a problem isn't it so we're talking about the school systems we're talking about sports we're talking about different organizations that your kids are a part of we're talking about church we're talking about just anything and everything work my boss he is such an idiot he might be an idiot but these types of people don't make an impact in the kingdom. So when you're with your spouse, are you negative and complaining about anything and everything? It's amazing what people complain about. You could be watching a baseball game. And somebody who is up to bat for your favorite team, whomever that is, Cardinals is the only right answer, by the way. So you got a Cardinal who's up to bat, and he strikes out, look and swing, it doesn't matter. And you're like, oh my gosh, why can't he hit that? Because it's 98 miles an hour? I don't know. Because you have a professional pitcher throwing really, really hard? If I was in the box, I'd probably do this every time. Like, oh, no, that's fast, and it's going to hit me. It'll break me. It'll break something on me. I mean, if, if the Cardinals, I mean, they're always looking for players. You could go try out, give it a shot. Well, it's easier to make fun of a guy or get mad at a guy for not hitting a baseball than it is to go out and do it yourself. It's easier to talk bad about a boss, a coach, a whoever, a whatever, than it is to actually do it. So Jude's like, if you're the type of person who's a grumbler and a fault finder, the, the behavior that you are embodying is that of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, we all do this to some extent and to some degree. We've all got to watch out for this. It's not like, well, I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I love Jesus, therefore I don't have to worry about this. Oh, man, listen. Whenever you and I interact with people, they are going to make mistakes. They're going to drop the ball. They're going to mess up. They're going to be imperfect. There's going to be better ways to do something that they're doing. How do you respond as a Jesus follower is paramount. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, Rome was playing at the state tournament at DuCoin. I'm there with my family. My youngest wants to rot his teeth. He's like, can I have some Skittles? And because I have money just laying around to throw to the dentist for cavities, I say, let's go rot your teeth. That's not how the actual conversation went, but, you know. So here we go. We go up there, and I just noticed, like, I'll call it a mob of people by the concession stand. And there are people angry and frustrated and rah, rah, rah. Turns out that when people order popcorn, they take a bag of popcorn like you'd buy like a little box with bags, and they put it in the microwave, and for two and a half minutes, they microwave the popcorn, and then there are people like just waiting for their popcorn. So if you're like five or six deep, you're 10, 12 minutes somewhere in that ballpark waiting for your popcorn. And, they, and people are just, I can't, you know. So I get up there, and I find out what's going on. We've got... Two kids, I don't know if they were high school or college, they were not like adults figuring this out, problem solving. And they were stressed out of their mind. So like one, one, one bag of, like the bag that came out, it was smoking. And they burnt it. And you know, one's like, you idiot, 
everybody, you know, and they're yelling at each other. He throws the bag, he puts another one in. He said, please tell me you don't want popcorn. I said, no, no, I'm good. I just want some Skittles. And we were talking. It turns out the machine broke. Someone was going to pick up a spare machine, but in the meantime, someone gave them boxes to put the, you know, pop the bags, and they were just like running around, stressed out. And it's like, one of them looked like a football player or wrestler. I'm like, y'all better be nice. Because if this dude, if his fuse breaks and he starts swinging, I wouldn't want to be in the way of his punch. But it's easy to when you're separated by a counter, right? So I said, hey, man, listen, you guys are doing a great job. It just is what it is. Just roll with it. People are mean. And he gave me a free bag of Skittles. <laughs> Wasn't that great? And I just thought, man, just you, if you're nice to somebody and just kind and you give them grace, like... Was that the most effective way to make popcorn for the state tournament for baseball? No, it was not. And to be fair, I didn't order popcorn, so I didn't care how long it was taking. Like, there's a caveat there, right? Maybe if I had ordered the popcorn, I'd be right there with everybody else. But I didn't order popcorn, so it mattered a little bit less to me. And just a little bit of kindness. Now, imagine, imagine for a moment... If I'm from DuCoin and I'm a pastor at a church in DuCoin, I got my church shirt on and I'm lighting them up for not making popcorn the right way. What do you think that does to the kingdom? What if they don't go to church? You think they're going to come to our church? This hypothetical DuCoin church that I'm a pastor at? Probably not. Because you've, you've robbed an opportunity to be a kingdom worker in that context. And instead, you chose to be a grumbler and a fault finder. The enemy will always leverage this type of behavior to build his kingdom. And our Lord and Savior will always use the mindset and the behaviors of 1 Corinthians 13 to build his kingdom. You and I get to choose in different moments what type of person we're going to be. And, and so I say, like, isn't that a little petty? We're just talking about popcorn at a game, a, you know, a 30-second interaction. Is it really that big a deal? Yes, it is. So when you go out to eat today, if you go out to eat on Sunday afternoons, like, you're going to get out of here in just a couple minutes, and it's going to be prime lunchtime, isn't it? And if it bothers you to wait on your food, start coming to the 9 o'clock service, you'll get to the restaurants a lot quicker, and it's not going to be as much of an issue, okay? But think about it, because I, for me, it's like there are times where I get frustrated about something, and it's like, I'm an adult. I'm not a two-year-old who was just told by his mom, no, you can't have ice cream until after supper. I don't, why am I throwing a fit about it's taking a little longer to get popcorn or get my meal or whatever? The big thing for me, like we were just in St. Louis for Clayton's birthday, we went to Slick City. Traffic, man. Oh, Traffic. Like, I'm driving, I'm like, oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I cannot handle this. I used to live in St. Louis, and I'm, I'm like, I'm so thankful I'm here. And I don't mind driving slow if there's a combine on the road. That doesn't bother me. But it does when there's like 30,000 people. I'm like, there are too many people. Nobody knows how to drive. Green means go. Like, what are we doing here? And my wife's always like, it's not like, you know, we have somebody's heart transplant in the back seat. We have to get to the hospital in 30 seconds or they're good. Like, it just is what it is. I'm like, you're right, it is. And it's not a big deal. And my life is not going to change for the better or worse if I'm two minutes later to a destination than what I would have been. But I let stuff like that get to me. So do you have stuff like that in your life that is so minor and insignificant, but it, you allow it to creep up? And become something that is like, why, why is this such a big deal to me? The wolves in sheep's clothing were ruining the name of Jesus and taking this church astray. I never want to be the type of person, whether I'm here, I'm out in public, I'm coaching, I'm whatever, where I embody this and I make Jesus look bad, or I make pastors look bad, or I make our church look bad. In moments of weakness, I gravitate towards this. We all do. But with the power that the Holy Spirit provides us, we can have strength to control our reactions to certain situations and be light and a tool for light 
as opposed to a tool for darkness. So this week, I want you to process through. What areas, what situations, what circumstances does this naturally come out of me? And how do I move from judging everybody, walk around with a clipboard, to picking up a towel and figuring out how I can be help as opposed to a critic? And I'm okay with you thinking critically about things, but we got to be careful about how we're critical of people, of organizations, and of the things that happen in our lives. Because if you become a grumbler and a fault finder, and that's your MO, and that's what you're known for, and that's kind of your default mode, Jesus will not be able to use that to grow his kingdom. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 